All right, so um, in 2014, the city of Flint, Michigan went bankrupt. Uh, there was about 100,000 people living in this city. A third of them were living under the poverty level. Uh, and when they went bankrupt, it was taken over by the state and um, saving money was a high priority. And so what they did is they shifted their agreement with the city of Detroit for water and they start pulling their water from a different river. All right. The Flint River is what they start pulling from. And as a result, the people thought that they were getting good water like they always did. But the new water supply coming from a different river was actually polluted and people started getting sick. All right, children started getting sick. People were being hospitalized. The hospitals noted that there was lead in their blood. Uh, 12 people died. Hundreds of people experienced hair loss, skin rashes. Uh, some had learning disabilities. Some experienced harm to different organs in their bodies. And what they found is that the water was so polluted that it actually affected the pipes and the pipes themselves were ruined. All right, people complained about the water smelling bad, tasting bad, looking bad but those in authority said that the water's just fine, keep using it. And so um, they kept showering with it, they kept bathing with it, they kept cooking with it. Uh, and it was a tragedy because the damage was unknown and internal until it man manifested externally for hundreds and thousands of people, right? And so what began as a $5 million issue became a $500 million issue. Um, leaders and authorities that were responsible for this, they were indicted, some were imprisoned, it, it was really messy. And even to this day, there's still a, a water crisis in the city of Flint. And so their water source was bad and by consequence, it eroded the infrastructure and flow that should have been life-giving and life-sustaining, but instead it was causing death and destruction. All right. Flint, Michigan is a great example of our lives and relationship to God. All right. God is meant to be our source of life, right? Jesus said it this way in John chapter four. He says, whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life, All right? And so in so many words, what Jesus was saying is, is if I'm your source, the benefit of that will flow into all the different areas of your life. It'll be life-giving to you, right? Great source great flow, life, All right. But a bad source equals a bad flow that's polluted and it causes internal corrosion and destruction that leads to death, All right? And so today we begin a short four week series called Rebellious Fidelity. Everyone say Rebellious Fidelity. Rebellious Fidelity. And say it like you mean it, Rebellious Fidelity. Rebellious Fidelity. See, if you, when you say that, you have to say it, yeah. right? Um, and so we're starting this new series, and this series is about our ultimate heart trusts. Um, it, it's what you can call an examination of the flow of your life that comes from the source of your choosing, all right? And so rebellious fidelity defined is a fierce and unwavering commitment to a cause or belief even in the face of opposition. Something or someone sits on the throne of every heart. We, we all give ultimate allegiance and authority to something in our lives. And I would submit to you that God must be that thing and everything else is the Flint River. Everything else, right? And while most believers know this, what we don't realize is that many of the other things that are vying uh, for our, our attention are actually trying to take that spot. They're trying to take the spot that only God should have. There are unfit, polluted, functional saviors all around us, right? It's yourself, your spouse, your money, power, respect, your career, your kids, and so on. And not only do we not realize that many other things are competing for our ultimate allegiance, but we also don't realize that it takes rebellious fidelity to keep God there. Right? Rebellious fidelity looks like Daniel who overcame obstacles, many obstacles to survive as a worshiper of Yahweh, but on the heels of an edict that would kill anyone who worships a God other than King Darius, he knelt down, and I love how the, the scripture says it, it says, as he had always done before, as he had always done before, 
and he prayed with his windows open toward Jerusalem. And because of that, he ended up being thrown in a lion's den. Rebellious fidelity looks like Esther, who finds out that there's a death sentence on every Jew in the kingdom. And only she can approach the king to talk him out of it, an act of which on its own could lead to her death. And as she mulled over what she should do here, in her self-talk, she proclaims, and I love this too, she says, if I perish, I perish. And then she walks into the throne room. Rebellious fidelity looks like Paul and Silas heading to a prayer meeting, just a daily prayer meeting. And after casting out a demonic spirit out of a local fortune teller, they were accused of disturbing the peace. They were severely beaten and thrown into the inhumane inner chamber of a Roman prison. And instead of feeling sorry for themselves, they turn that place into the prayer room and begin singing worship songs. Rebellious fidelity looks like Jesus, overwhelmed to the point of blood, sweat, and tears over his crucifixion that's to come in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says to his father, literally, please, if you can, take this cup from me. But, and here's the key words, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And then he gets up and he heads towards this crowd coming towards him with clubs and torches. Rebellious fidelity looks like trusting God with everything you have, with all of your heart, and refusing to believe the lies you tell yourself to, pay your, to, to spare yourself of hard things. But instead, giving your life in full surrender to God over and over again, believing that he will lead you to his own protective care. Kind of sounds like a passage of scripture we know, right? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says this. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Right? And so today, we're going to focus on the first part of that passage. We're going to take the next four weeks to break this passage down. Today, we're just going to look at the first part, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to start uh, by having a testimony from my good friend. You already heard him sing this morning. So Jared's going to come up, and he's going to share his testimony of trusting the Lord. Can you just stand up and give him a hand as he comes up? All right. It's lonely up here without all the musicians behind me. So... Um, I got to put a timer on because I talk a lot. Okay, so, um, hi, how's it going? Um, so, uh, I was, uh, hopefully, in my story, there's a, you know, a thread of, of trust that you could see kind of unravel from my background to where I'm at now. And um, so, I was born Jehovah Witness. Um, I was born into that organized religion. My family is still high up in in that organized religion. Uh, mom, dad, brother, sister, my sister passed away. Um, but at a very young age, um, I was kept in this bubble to where I couldn't hang out with anybody outside of that. Um, I couldn't uh, uh, associate with anybody outside of that. And um, I felt uh, like muzzled and trapped emotionally at a very young age. So they taught a lot of um, fear, you know, a lot of the literature that they read is um, outside literature that they produce, and then it's like scriptures taken out of context to kind of fit that, right? So it was this constant like fire and brimstone as a child going like, um, if I sin, then God's going to come and kill me, you know? So at a very young age, I was emotionally uh, just plugged up, right? I remember crying many times in, in my bed, like eight years old, like thinking that God was going to kill me for something that I did at school that day. Um, so there was no one that I could really run to, no one that I can talk to and go like, hey, like, I don't really believe in this because my whole family was in it. Um, <clears throat> so these are just bullet points. There's a lot that happened. But at 16, um, I decided that I wanted out. And um, I called my own committee meeting, which is like, you bring the elders to this meeting. I had been in those meetings before, but it was always uh, them calling me in there because I was in trouble. But I was like, you know what? I got a car. I got a job. Uh, you know, I got a place to live. You know, I'm out of here. Like the Eminem album just dropped. Like, I'm going to listen to that. I'm going to go live that life, right? So, like, I was, and after that, like, I was in the wilderness. And to keep it, like, short, like, it was, it was just 
20 years of, of living in my self-will, doing what I wanted to do, um, didn't know who, who I was, didn't know how to uh, build relationships with people because every relationship that I tried to build had conditions. So as a kid, I had to like wear this mask with these people because I didn't want them to tell on me, right? And I had to like walk this line and be fake. So like there was no grace, none at all. It was all uh, walk this line and you might be saved, right? So um, I, had, I knew nothing about, about grace. But when I was in the wilderness, um, I heard a lot of people. I did a lot of things that hurt a lot of people, a lot of people that I love. Um, but I came to this place uh, where the life that I was living, like the pain that I was in, um, was greater than the pain that I was running from, right? Like it, it just, there was this shift inside of me where I was like, something has to change. And so I decided to get some help. You know, I cut off all those friends that I was hanging out with, changed my number, um, got some counseling, did many years of, of you know, like self-help groups and um, met some people in those groups. And they were like, I have a, a, a higher power. I have a God. Like, what is your God? You know? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, I don't know what that is. They're like, well, you should probably find one. So like one day I just um, decided to open up a Bible. I'm like, you know what? Like... I've never read the thing all the way through on my own, but let me just open it up. So I opened it up and started reading it and like within the first page, two pages, I was, I was angry, right? Like, why is the tree there? Like, we wouldn't even be in this situation if the tree wasn't put there, right? Like I was angry with God, I was wrestling with God, like I was, and it was like this. So that was my, that's what had to happen. I had no understanding, right? Like I had no understanding of, uh, of how it worked. Um, so I was reading it and I, you know, I was just going, I'm gonna continue to read this thing, I'm gonna read the whole thing, and uh, if something happens, something happens, you know? And the, there was a few shifts that happened, and one of them was I was on this trip with these guys, uh, friends of mine by the ocean, and I was telling them that I was, hey man, I started reading the Bible, I was a couple, cha couple chapters in, and um, one of them found a book on the shelf in the house that we rented, and it was uh, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. And he was like, dude, you gotta read this. And that just cracked it all open for me. How the triune God works, um, why, you know, how, how the perspectives are different, right, than what I had ever seen. And so I, I didn't do anything that weekend but read that book. And I ordered it and read it, you know, several times after that. Um, so that happened. And, once I read that book, I started listening to like YouTube uh, preachers and started, you know, buying more books off Amazon. Like I asked my wife, I got like a stack of books like this tall. I've read like half of half of them. Um, but when I see it, I buy it. I'm like, I got it. Um, so after, after that, after I, you know, started like immersing myself in knowledge, right? Like I, I had this heart to learn. Um, I still had spirit of religion and condemnation all over me, right? Like that was all over me, it, it wasn't gone. And um, I was like, you know what, I'm gonna go to a church. Like I had never been to a service before, like outside of Jehovah Witness. So I was like, I'm just gonna go by myself and like ch check it out. So I went to a couple different places in the Thomas where I live, went, it was kind of cool. I was like, okay, I could feel the message. And then I had met Brandon and Josephine, you know, like a, pr a couple years prior. And uh, they called me one day, and they're like, hey, why don't you come check out The Rock? You know, I was like, okay, I'll come check out The Rock. So I came here, and uh, I judged all you guys. I was judging everybody, <laughs> just judging everything. I'm like, why is dude on the floor? Like, why is the music so long? Like, you know, like, I was, judged, I was hurt. Like, in hindsight, I know, like, I had pain inside, and I had hurt inside that, was, uh, that needed to be undone, you know? But I trusted, I knew that while I was here, I could feel a shift inside of my heart. Like if I came in with stuff um, and I left, I, I was noticing I, was, I could feel a shift and I was in the word every single day. I was reading it every day. It was like this, I knew it, it was to almost like just say that I read it all so I could make a decision, but I knew that if I read it every single day that I was gonna get the answers that I, that I needed, whether it was believing in God or not, right? So I just kept doing it. Um, but one day I came here and, um, I was going through some stuff and this is another shifting moment that happened and, um, there was an altar call 
and I was just going through it. And I had never been up there before. I had never got hands laid on me. And I came up front right here, and the Holy Spirit hit me for the first time, right? And I ended up, I was the dude that I was judging, right, on the floor. I'm like, God's like, ha ha, I got you, right? And like, I stayed there. Dude was preaching, and I was still there, you know? So um, I ended up just losing it, you know, just a shower cry. Went in the bathroom and like looked at myself in the mirror, and I'm like, like that had to be God, right? Like, and from that moment on, like God started speaking into my life. Like the voice of God started speaking into my life, and my my prayers were longer prayers, and I wanted to stay in the Word longer. Like I had this heart for God, but I still had the spirit of religion and condemnation over me. I still couldn't trust, especially leadership. Like, because where I came from, the leadership, like, they're out to get you. They're out to reprimand you. They're sin sniffers. Like, they're trying to find everything raw so they can, like, get you, right? And so, um, like, I had to figure out, you know, how to trust God enough to, to put myself out there in order for him to undo these things. And I believe he put things into my life. He put people into my life over this time. Um, but it wasn't easy. Like, if... If trust was an object, um, there's my claw marks all over it, right? And I'm giving it to God, and I'm taking it back, and I'm giving it to him, and I'm taking him back. But what I can say is over, over the years, um, the areas of my life that I've fully given to him, um, I'm free, right? And, and there's freedom in that. Um, but he's still working on me, you know? And it's almost like trial and error. Like, I have to... Uh, see where I'm living in self-will and where I'm actually trusting him and turning it over and I have to feel the spiritual pain that I'm in going like why am I feeling this right stay in the word understand and stay in prayer and then he'll speak to me and tell me Jaron I'm keeping you in this situation because I'm molding you to be more like Christ you're showing up to your work situation in the wrong way I'm asking you to be a light in a dark place that's why, because these people are, you know, the situation might be something that's tumultuous, but I'm showing it up in the wrong way. So I have to stay prayed up. I have to stay in the foundation of the word. Um, but when I was doing this, the Lord kept telling me, I kept hearing surrender and trust, surrender and trust, right? So there's a certain amount of surrender that I have to do before I can fully trust. And if I don't have, it's like any other relationship, if I don't know the person, how can I trust them? So I have to stay in the word in order to learn who God is and who his characteristics are. And it has to be a daily thing. But surrender and trust. So if I'm anxious, I surrender, and then I trust. If I'm fearful, I surrender, and I trust. If I'm an addict, I surrender, and I trust, right? So that's how I try and, and keep that trust vein open is through those prayers. And um, I mean, just from where I came from to where I am now, it's like, it, it, it's night and day. And, and, and you know, uh, the scripture, do not lean on your own understanding. Like it's a clear, I, I, I could see it clearly. My own understanding brought this rotten fruit that, that hurt everybody and hurt myself. And I didn't know who I was. And then when I surrender, then he makes my path straight, right? as long as I'm trusting in him every day. So the scripture is so true, um, you know, and, and I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful to tell my testimony. Um, I'm not perfect. Uh, all of us are a work in progress, right? But through his grace, right, the grace that he has, you know, like the condemnation has been broken off of me. Right, he put he put people in my life to say no. Like this is this is how it works. And then when I was coming to the rock, I'm reading the word. I'm going wait. Like the things I'm reading in the Bible are actually what's playing out in this place. Right. So I tied those two together. So I had trust in that. Right. Um, so I was able to uh, let a lot of my um, my my anger towards people, my anger towards you know that organization. Like I pray for the people there. Right. I pray for my family. Um, and I'm able to uh, just live a better life today. That's all I got. Amen. 
Amen, amen. Don't follow me. All right. So trust in the Lord uh, require. Actually, before I do that, I just want to acknowledge a woman of God in the building, Joan Nordberg. It's her birthday today. She's 60 years old. Now, I know we don't, we don't normally tell ladies ages, but that, that's, a, that's a beautiful day. All right, so we love you. Thank you for everything you do. You are amazing. Um, listen, she, everything she does, she does with the spirit of excellence, right? Whether you're hanging out with her in the kitchen, she's directing traffic, whether you're out at food pantry, right? I even went to the house and watched a, a 49ers game, and she's taking care of business. And I mean, everywhere she goes, she's on top of things. So we love you. Thank you for everything you do. You're amazing. You're amazing. All right. All right. So trusting in the Lord with all your heart requires three things. All right. I'll share this with you. It requires three things. Um, trusting the Lord with all your heart requires more self-awareness than you think. It requires a lifetime to figure out and an outside influence that you can't control. All right. More self-awareness than you think a lifetime to figure out and an outside influence you can't control. So let's look at these together. All right, so first, more self-awareness than you think. So uh, early in the book of Genesis, there's this conversation that God has with Cain um, that's pretty unsettling because um, God reveals some things about the human heart that we really don't think about, right? Now, if you're familiar with the story, you know that Adam and Eve, they had uh, twins, twin boys, Cain and Abel, and uh, both Cain and Abel brought their offering to the Lord. Uh, and the Bible says that God looked at Abel's offering with favor, but rejected Cain's offering. Right? And so God saw that it made Cain upset. He was angry. He was jealous. And so God approaches Cain and he says, hey, man, like, why are you angry? Like, if you just do right, you'll be all right. Everything will be fine. And then very specific language, he says, but sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it, all right? I mean, this is God's metaphor. This is God speaking, all right? God says to him, hey, sin is crouching, right? To crouch means to hide. It means to get low so that you're not seen. And so the first thing that God uh, is revealing to us uh, about sin in relationship to our hearts is that, is that sin always hides itself. It hides itself, right? What's wrong with you will certainly come to the surface and affect other people. So we generally know what's wrong with us, right? We, we generally have an idea uh, of, what's, of what's going on, but your sins will always appear to you to be less serious and smaller than they really are. Right or wrong? Right? We, we judge other people by their actions, but we tend to judge ourselves by our intentions, right? It hides its power from you. We, we, we have this, this inner lawyer on the inside of us that is always ready and able to justify anything we say or do, don't we? Sin hides its power from us. Uh, but not only that, uh, God goes on with this metaphor. He, he likens sin to a predator. All right. He says, it desires to have you. It wants to consume and overtake you, is what he's saying. And so when you engage in sin, it's not something that you do and then it's done. Oh, no. When you sin, it's not something that's just done and it's, it's, it's over. No, it's much more than that. Right? When, you're, when you're selfish instead of serving, when you worry instead of trust, right? When you pay back instead of forgive, when you lie instead of tell the truth, right? Sin becomes a reality in your life. It, 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 it grows in you. It becomes an influencing presence in your life. And so most of us are not self-aware enough to know that the throne of our heart is contested territory. All right. Our sinful nature wants anything but God in the top spot of our hearts, right? And it takes a rebellion. Like sometimes, sometimes you actually have to tell yourself, no, have, have you ever done that before where you just had to say out loud, I am not doing that? Yeah. And you're talking to yourself? Yeah. Yeah. All right, happens to me at the gym all the time, by the way. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm on the treadmill, I'm running, running on the treadmill, right? It's like, it's, it's the reverse of that R. Kelly song. My body's telling me no, my mind's telling me yes, right? <laughs> so I'm running and my, I'm literally, my body's like, stop, stop, stop. And I'm like, nah, we're just, we're going, we're going. And then I'll get a cramp in my side. I never get a cramp in my side. My body starts fighting against me. And I'm like, all right, you just got to figure it out. You know, I just run through, right? You have to fight with yourself sometimes, right? It takes fidelity. It takes a stubborn loyalty to keep God as your greatest heart trust, right? Christian maturity is happening in you when you begin to discredit anything that is not God from having the place of ultimate authority in your life. Your spouse is not your ultimate authority. Your, your preferred political party or political candidate is not the ultimate authority in your life. Your favorite celebrity is not your ultimate authority. Your college professor or textbook author is not your ultimate authority. Right? Right? Even your favorite pastor <laughs> or theologian, your favorite theologian, okay, gets it wrong is not your ultimate authority. Okay, it's just not, right? And probably the most important, probably, probably the per person you trust the most, you are not the ultimate authority in your life, right? It's all the Flint River, guys, bad sources, pollution, yuck, yuck. All right, let, let me just prove this to you. I, I thought about this this week. I kind of laughed about this. All right, let, let me tell you why you can't trust you. Can I do that? Is that, I'll just take a minute. All right, let me just start with massaging us with some scripture first. Okay, so three, three, three scriptures, right? Jeremiah 17, nine says, the heart is deceitful and beyond cure. Who can understand it? The heart is deceitful. Your heart doesn't have your best interests at heart. First John 3, 20, if our hearts condemn us, we know God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Psalm 73, 26, I love this. The psalmist says, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Scripture is constantly pointing us back to God because it knows that we are tempted to make ourselves the ultimate authority. We're tempted to do that, right? Uh, Francis Spufford um, is a, a British Christian writer. He wrote a book called Unapologetic, and he makes this point. Uh, he says, you are a being whose wants make no sense. They don't harmonize. Your desires deep down are discordantly arranged so that you truly want to possess and you truly want not to at the very same time. Human beings are equipped, you eventually realize, for farce or even tragedy more than for happy endings. Let, let, me, let me make this a little bit more personal, all right? Uh, when, when I think about the things I did as a 20-year-old and a 30-year-old, now as a 40-year-old, if I could, I would punch my 20-year-old and 30-year-old self. Um, as an 18-year-old, um, I got my girlfriend pregnant. And one of the first things I thought to myself when this happened, as I said to myself, surely she's not gonna keep this thing. Now, that goes even deeper when I later realized that that's exactly what my dad said to my mom when he found out that she was pregnant with me. I thought that, I was like, surely she's not gonna keep this thing. And so then we get to this point where we have to start telling people and, um, and so I had to watch how this devastated her family when she told her family that we were pregnant. And then I had to watch as it devastated her faith community. Now, I was going to her church, but I wasn't really walking with Jesus. I was going to church with her and for her. And so I didn't really care that much, but it killed me to see the way it completely ripped apart the church when this happened. It was really hard. And so weeks and weeks of this, we're dealing with this, and we're finally kind of getting to a point where it's like, okay, all the craziness is over. Right when that happens, she miscarries. 
And I remember being at the hospital and, um, and so she was in the room and I was in the waiting room and I remember not having the guts. I mean, Amy's in the room and she is like weeping and mourning the loss of the stillborn. And I'm in the, the waiting room and I don't have the guts to walk into the room and I don't. I don't walk in there, I don't comfort her and I don't see the baby. And I'm just telling you guys, if I ever see my 18 year old self, it's on sight. We are throwing hands. Coward. Coward. As a 30 year old, um, you know, we, you know, one of the benefits of living in this day of age, in age is that so much of our lives are documented on the internet, yeah? And so I hear sermons that I preached at age 30, and I am mortified. <laughs> Bob, ever, yeah? Like, I hear stuff that I preached when I was 30, and I, I thought I had it. I thought I was him, right? Like I was like, blah, blah, blah. And I'm listening to it now. I'm like, oh my, oh my, what am I saying? I had no clue. I just had no clue. I had no clue. Uh, Some so of you guys will, will relate to this. Have you seen the stuff that you posted on Facebook 10 years ago? Oh, goodness. The, the stuff I posted on Facebook 10 years ago, I'm like, what is wrong? So, so here's what I'm trying to get to. So if I want to punch my 20-year-old self, my 18, 20-year-old self, and if I want to slap my 30-year-old self, what is my 50-year-old self going to want to do to to me now? (laughs) Guys, I think I have a pretty level head. Like, I think I, you know, I think I think pretty straight about things. But I'm confident that when I'm 50, there's things right now that I think I have a great grasp of that I have no clue about. And so why would I wanna trust myself above all things when I have shown historically that I am untrustworthy? So to trust in the Lord with all your heart means that other things can't have it. And it takes more self-awareness about sin in yourself to do it, amen? Secondly, uh, not only does it take more self-awareness than you think, but it also takes a lifetime to figure out. If you're going to trust in the Lord with all your heart, it takes a lifetime to figure out. Trusting God is not a one-time decision. It is an ongoing relationship, right? It is a resolve to open your heart in the, relation, in, in, in the relationship continually. Excuse me. I mean, I, I have sparred with sin for over 20 years, right? And as a pastor, I've walked with enough people who are battling sin to know that one of the biggest factors that determine whether or not we fall into sin is not the temptation to do wrong. Hear me on this. One of the biggest factors that determine if people fall into sin, it's not the temptation to do something wrong. We all know that temptations are out there. We all know temptation is coming and it's not the thing that we're tempted by, right? We generally know what our sinful triggers are. Right? But the thing that determines, one of the biggest factors that determines whether we fall into sin is where our hearts are when the temptation comes to us. Are you hearing me? Where your heart is. Surely you've done this before. You're tempted to do something that you know you shouldn't do. And so you're confronted with this thing and you say, no. But days and maybe weeks later, that same temptation with that same thing comes and you fall. Have you been there? All right. Have you been there? Our heart posture matters. Where your heart is matters. And so trusting God is an ongoing relationship. Just because you trusted God yesterday doesn't mean you don't have to trust him today. Amen. It's ongoing, right? Fidelity to God takes a lifetime to master. Uh, trusting God is a struggle in the area of dependence. It's not about uh, who is in control. God is truly the one who's in control. It's about what kind of relationship we want with the one who is in control. And so the moral temptation, I love that phrase, moral temptation, you probably never thought those two could be put together. But the moral temptation that we have to look out for and what many of us have been, I would say everyone in this room has been guilty of, 
is this idea of autonomy. Everyone say autonomy. Now, I learned this. This is, this is fresh for me. I've learned this. Autonomy is the attempt to do the spiritual life on your own. It's the attempt to do the spiritual life on your own. It's the tendency to live our lives, even our faith, trusting in ourselves alone. It's, it's what happens when we try to live for Jesus and serve Jesus without the help of Jesus. Right? It, it's the reason why you embrace Christianity, but you don't change. It, it's, it, it's, the, it's the reason why someone can say, man, I've been a Christian for 20 years, but in reality, they've just been a one-year-old Christian 20 times. All right, word to Pete Scazzaro. All right, it, 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 autonomy is about our desire to rely on our own knowledge and effort instead of faith and trust. Guys, this happens more than we think, way more than we think. Can I just, just want to give you an example. So you come here and maybe, let's just say I, I preach a sermon on prayer. All right, not when I was 30, but when I'm 40. Okay, so I kind of know what I'm talking about a little more. All right, so I preach a sermon on prayer. And you leave here, and the thing you say to yourself is, I, I'm, I'm going to start praying more. I'm going to pray for an hour every day. Like, I'm going to start praying for an hour every day. And that's an honorable thing, right, to want to pray more. But this is what autonomy looks like, is you don't go to God with this thing. You just say, I'm going to do this. And, and, and I, I want to make this point very clear. Rebellious fidelity is not me saying, try harder. That's not what this is about. Trusting the Lord is not about try harder. Rebellious fidelity, when we say that, what we mean is, if you would just make God your ultimate trust, the ultimate authority in your life, it could change everything. It's that good flow, right? It's that good flow. But rebellious fidelity comes in because everything in your life is trying to knock him off the throne, right? That's where the fight comes in. It's not about trying harder, right? And so when, when you hear someone talk about prayer, you know what you need to do with that? Pray about it. Take it to God. Go to God and say, God, you know my heart is to pray more. You know I want to pray more. Can you please show me what obstacles are in the way? What's hindering me from giving my heart more to you? God, I want to pray. Take it to God. We see this in other ways where, you know, you see things that, that are happening. And I don't know how to say this without it just sounding kind of whack, but it is like, sure, okay, the lights are beaming on me, but I'm telling you guys, there's nothing about being on stage that's that awesome. I promise you. My kids will tell you I'm not that impressive at all. <laughs> like, at all. Okay? You look at guys like Pastor Bob, okay? Right? Worldwide Bob, Bob the Builder, right? <laughs> and look, and he's, he's all over the world doing all this cool stuff, blah, blah, blah. And maybe you look at him and you're like, man, I want to do that. I'm a, that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do for the Lord. I'm going to just start traveling. I'm a, I'm, yeah, I'm going to do that. I went on one missions trip with him and was like, I'm out. <laughs> nope. Nope. Yeah, talk to him about pulling dead bodies out of rubble and praying for families while burying their kids and loved ones. I ask him about going to Pakistan and going somewhere just to eat and the local authorities coming in and flanking you just to stare at you and intimidate you. Um, he sent me pictures of his trip um, in Nepal and I'm looking at all the pictures. He's dedicating wells and churches and houses and all this stuff. And I'm just looking, I'm, I'm like, what's wrong with your leg? He has this big gash in his leg. I'm like, what happened to your leg? He was like, oh, yeah, I fell in a river and bruised some ribs. But my phone didn't get broken, so I'm good. <laughs> I'm like, look, man, I'd have to tell these folks, we're going to dedicate this another day. I'm going home. Right? So listen, like, Bob is going where the wild things are. 
right? But he's doing it because God told him to do it, not because it's just a good idea, right? Not, not just because he has some frequent flyer miles that he wants to use up, okay? All right? All right. Listen, autonomy is about trying to do this stuff on your own, right? God is in control, relieving you and I of the burden of trying to be. And the moral temptation is to opt for autonomy because it doesn't require relationship. This is why autonomy is something we all fall into. It doesn't require relationship, right? It takes a lifetime to work this out, right? And so let me, let me, I want to give you the keys to unconditional trust. So Elizabeth Elliot was the precious wife of a martyred missionary uh, who went back to reach the very people that killed her husband, Jim Elliot. And, and I heard her say this. She said, this is a lot, but just try to follow me. She said, the more we pay for advice, the more we are likely to listen to it. Advice from a friend, which is free, we may take or leave. Advice from a consultant we've paid much for personally, we're more likely to accept, but it's still our choice. We can take it or leave it. But the guidance of God is different. First of all, we do not come to God asking for advice, but for God's will, and that is not optional. And God's fee is the highest one of all. It costs everything. And so to ask for the guidance of God requires abandonment. We no longer say, I will trust you. Uh, if I trust you, you will give me such and such. Instead, we must say, I trust you. Give me or withhold from me whatever you choose. All right. To trust God unconditionally, we must obey what he says and accept what he sends. If you want to learn how to trust God unconditionally, you must obey what he says. You must accept what he sends. It means to say, God, I will obey anything you tell me, whether I understand it or not. And I will accept anything you send me, whether I understand it or not. All right. So that's the key to unconditional trust. The key to giving all your heart to God is one word. Honesty. It's honesty. There's this uh, interaction that Jesus has uh, with the man in, in uh, Mark chapter 9. Um, and this man's son is possessed, um, and he's been trying to get help from Jesus' disciples. They haven't been able to help him. Jesus comes to the scene, and the man asks Jesus, hey, can you help me? And Jesus says, can I help you? Everything is possible for the one who believes. And the man responds honestly. This is the key here. The man says, I do believe. Please help me overcome my unbelief. He responds honestly. That the key to trusting God is to tell him honestly, I don't trust you. Guys, this has changed my life over the last couple of years. If you go to God and tell him, I don't trust you, do you know what's happening? You're slowly beginning to trust. That's what's happening. The key to giving your heart to God is to tell him honestly, I don't know how to and I kind of don't want to, right? And by telling him that honestly, guys, he already knows. He's not going to be like, oh, how you would say such a thing. He already knows. And you may need to do this every day for years. It may take a lifetime, but God's here for it. He's here for it. Trusting God takes more self-awareness than you think. It takes a lifetime to figure out, lastly, an outside influence that you can't control. Worship team, you guys can come back. We're going um, to take communion in a moment. Trusting God with all your heart is impossible without the help of God. All right? You do not possess on your own the wisdom or the power to trust God without him doing all of the work. He does all the heavy lifting, right? He does all the heavy lifting. It's our job to respond, all right? It's our job to respond. I want to give you one more quote and one more passage, and we're going we're gonna to pray. Uh, Dr. John Coe. Now, now, he's not the Dr. John we love the most, but he's a Dr. John nonetheless. Um, he's a spiritual formation expert at Biola University. He says this. He says, spiritual disciplines don't transform you. 
they open you to the God who can. Right? Listen, only God can grow you. Only God can change you. Only God can heal you. Only God can do it. If you trust him and give him your heart, it's in good hands. Better hands than your own. Better hands than your own. Um, I want to read this passage to you that, that shows us why. In Deuteronomy 7, Moses is preparing the children of Israel to go into the promised land, and I love how he lets them know how little they have to do with being chosen. Um, starting in verse 6 of Deuteronomy 7, it says, uh, this is Moses talking to the children of Israel. He says, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. So they probably heard that. They were like, sounds good. Holy, chosen, treasured. Yeah, that sounds like us. Like, we're, we're pretty amazing. He's right. And then Moses says this, verse 7. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other people's. For you were the fewest of all people. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. See, what, what makes God a good and worthy source to have all of your trust and to have all of your heart is knowing that you don't have to earn God. You don't have to perform to get God. It's nothing you can control. I mean, just think about that for a moment. There is nothing you can do to make God love you. Because there's nothing you did to make him start loving you in the first place. When God says to the children of Israel, uh, what he says to them, he says to us, which is this, I love you not, but because, not because of who you are and what you can do. No, I love you because I love you. You know, if Amy were to come to me and thankfully she doesn't do this, but if she were to come to me and say, Sean, do you love me? Of course I would say yes. And if she said, why? <laughs> I mean, I could say to her, you know, I love you because of your beautiful blue eyes. I love you because you're just the most faithful person. I love you because your shoe game is always on point. <laughs> like, I, like, we, like if I just kept going on to start saying this, 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 and this, eventually what she would think to herself is, oh, wow, this guy loves me for all these other reasons. But what she really wants to hear and what the truth is and what God would say to you and me today is, I love you because I love you, because I love you. You don't have to help me. I was doing all right. <laughs> you and I will have a rebellious fidelity to something. We will entrust our hearts to someone. And anything that is not God is the Flint River, guys. It's a bad source. It's polluted. Only God can produce a life-giving flow that blesses every area of your life. But you have to trust him. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing. And as we sing, we're going to pass the communion elements around.
Matthew 26, verse 26 says, while they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. It's like, I was like, how do you lose this little piece of edible styrofoam? So, <laughs> so let's pray over the bread. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for your body that was broken for us. God, we thank you that today as we talked about trusting you is about obeying what you say and accepting what you send. We thank you, Jesus, that you obeyed every single thing your father asked you to do. And though you did it perfectly, you also accepted the cross, which is our cross that we should have taken. Thank you that your body was broken for us. And so as we take this today as a spiritual family, we remember the sacrifice, what you went through for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take an eat. So I'm real eager to open this juice and wash this thing down. Verse 27, and when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. I love how this goes on, but I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day that I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. I was sharing this uh, in Santa Cruz a couple weeks ago. It's really interesting. Jesus is with all of his friends, and he says, man, this is, this is the last time I'm going to do this until we drink this together on my wedding day. There's coming a day, guys. We're going to do this again. And it's going to be the best day ever. And so this is just a taste of it. Guys, as we take the juice, this is just a taste of what's to come for all of us. It's because Jesus' blood was shed. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And so Jesus, as we take this drink, as my mouth is so dry, God, we just thank you that we have such a desperate need of you. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission of sins. Thank you, Jesus, that you paid the ultimate price. We drink this today knowing that there's a day that we get to celebrate with you in your kingdom. This is just a foretaste. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Let's drink. Amen. Amen. Yeah, so you have buckets that are coming by. If you would just drop everything in the bucket, that'll help us. So we're going to have our prayer team come forward. Um, if you need prayer, we would love to pray with you. If you would like for us to partner with you on anything, we would love to. If you're here today, you would say, Sean, there, there are things in my life that I need to demote. There are things that I need to move off the throne of my heart. We want to pray for you. If you would say, I've been doing this life of Je with Jesus on my own. I've been doing this, this Christian autonomy thing, and I need to give Jesus my all in all. We would love to partner with you on that as well. Amen. So let me just pray for you. Father, I just thank you for this beautiful family of believers. Thank you, God, for 
all that you're doing in us. God, I thank you for my brother, Jared, and just sharing his story of trust. But we all have the same story. We all have the same journey, Lord God, of trying to trust you. And unless and until we put ourselves in a position where you can fail us, we'll, know that we'll never know that you won't fail us. And so, Lord, we just thank you. Help us to trust you with all of our hearts. We thank you for that. Give us a rebellious fidelity that allows us to keep you in the first place. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen, amen. amen.